history has always been the handmaiden of victors unless the lions have their own historians the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter and while this is absolutely true it assumes a greater importance in the context of india wherein since times immemorial we are either seeing our history being erased or being substituted with biased narratives whether it was the rn invasion theory in the times of the british raj or even in post independent india where in continue to read history written with particular prejudices bias and colors join me today as i interview renowned historian dr vikram sampath most well known for his two volume book on the biography of veer savarkar let's discuss what vikram has to say about the biases in history and how is the future looks like for indian history writing keep watching hi vikram hi hi great so finally uh, we are meeting here virtually and i expected we have a huge fan base and it is getting reflected in the uh, number of people joining <laughs> I'm, I'm quite sure this is going to be the highest audience so far for uh, any of my uh, live sessions. So, yeah. so you are based out of uh, Bangalore, I guess. Yes, I'm based in Bangalore. Bangalore. Okay, yeah. And a couple of uh, you know, uh, my followers asked if you'd be able to take some audience questions uh, sure. later on. I mean, not in terms of video; they will be writing it here, no. and no, no, I can sure. read out for you. So, yeah. sure. Ooh. Or right, it's one, one past where I think we can start then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On dot. Okay. Great. So, <laughs> thank thank you very much, Vikram, for uh, joining this session of Kitabi Baate. I know we had been interacting since quite some time, and finally, it's it's happening today. So, I guess though you don't need an introduction, but for the sake of convention, I will be giving a brief introduction of uh, Vikram. So, Bangalore-based historian Dr. Vikram Sampath is the author of eight acclaimed books. including splendors of royal mysore my name is gohar jan voice of the veena a biography of s bala chandra and importantly the brave hearts of bharat which is his latest book and his two volume biography savarkar echoes from a forgotten past and savarkar a contest legacy which went on to become national best sellers and were acclaimed by none other than prime minister shri narendra modi in 2021 dr sampath was conferred the honor of being elected as a fellow of uk's prestigious royal historical society he was also awarded the sahitya academy first yuva puraskar in english literature and AR, ars international award for excellence in historical research in new york an mba in finance from svj in mumbai an engineer from bits pilani dr sampath is also a trained carnatic vocalist he is also known for being the founder director of earth a culture fest that's indeed a very impressive sketch i must say and earth it always uh, reminds me so there is this incident i saw you for the first time at earth it was in 2018 i guess i don't know the year and then we met at intact in delhi near uh, lori colony ah you came to deliver a talk on your book on the first part of book it was not released and right. i had this interaction with vikram for about 5 minutes or so discussing our you had a very good one on one interaction and then i just casually said oh i think i saw you at earth as well and uh, vikram in his very calm and composed manner said well i was the organizer of earth <laughs> i was like oh okay he is not just attending he was the organizer great i think yeah yes yeah. so we can start vikram so vikram talking about your books but before that uh, history it is said is the handmaiden of victors and you yourself mentioned this in uh, uh, brave hearts of bharat looking at this statement in the context of india so we had various episodes of our history in a sense being erased whether it's a burning of books at the times of khilji uh, whether it was the britishers who uh, you know asked uh, led us to believe in things like the aryan invasion theory and false notions about our culture unfortunately it seems that if this trend continued even after independence so in terms of education and definitely the brown sahibs took over the white sahibs and we had a lot of distortions lot of even false narratives being built up and lot many instances where uh, many nation builders did not get their due in in the history books so as a historian what's your take on this no uh, uh, that's certainly true abhishek because uh, uh, as someone or novel had said that he who controls the past controls the present and also the future exactly. so i think he said you know history has been the handmaiden of the ruler 
and uh, whoever it is because it history in our growing up years we do not realize the importance of this discipline right. uh, we it's yet another subject which we have to you know cram up and then uh, uh, can't score marks well and so on but as you grow up and as you realize uh, that this is one area which uh, it's a mirror in which we can identify ourselves as a nation right. as a civilization it gives us gives us that sense of identity uh, and so that is why everybody uh, especially those in power would always like to control uh, you know the, the historical narrative that comes about now obviously our colonial masters had a certain uh, agenda behind the control of the history to tell us that you know you write from that myth that you mentioned of the aryan invasion theory which has now been debunked yes. uh, by whether it is modern scientific or genetic studies and linguistics and all of that the idea there was to tell the natives so to say that uh, your earliest inhabitants to have been invaders so yes. we the are only the last in this long list outside who have come to rule you uh, and so it's nothing new you are destined to be ruled by outsiders uh, it's yes. only people outside who will give you a sense of uh, you know civilization education culture and all of that and so it was a kind of rationalization of the uh, british the raj yes so uh, but uh, what was sad was as you mentioned post independence we i think had a golden opportunity to uh, correct a lot of these wrongs uh, which we unfortunately did not for several reasons uh, one was of course uh, you know the the manner especially uh, you know post 1970s once the congress uh, almost literally gave away the mandate of education and history writing to particularly the uh, those allied to the marxist ideology uh, there was a certain bent of hist- historiography in india particularly academic historiography which kind of re- uh, perpetuated several of these myths added that sense of looking back at your past with a sense of you know um, uh, what would i say, apologetic about about it now every society has its ups and downs has negative uh, areas yes. but we specifically concentrated only on the negatives rather yes. than focusing on the positives uh, you know we uh, it needs to be a good balance of both the things exactly. in my opinion and uh, you know there is a very thin line as i always maintain between that sense of genuine pride that you can feel about your own past yes. your own uh, Uh, achievements of your ancestors to jingoism so that is why uh, i think that balance needs to be maintained so today also when there is all this talk about rewriting history and so on i think that sense of balance uh, is very important we are seeing all these uh, uh, controversies are the mughals being erased yes. from books and all that which yes. uh, is i don't subscribe to that kind of a uh, you know school of thought which which says something needs to be excised from your history good yes. cannot wish away your, your past yes. uh, right yes. so is a part of your uh, history so that is my larger take on this entire journey of indian historiography itself but the larger uh, you know uh, point abhishek is that history as a discipline should foster multiple uh, you know viewpoints there yes, need to be there need needs to be dissent there needs to be differences of opinion there needs to be a kind of you know uh, altern- altering of contesting uh, yeah. but for a longest time in india it's just been a very very single monochromatic version of yes. history which has ruled the roost and today that is being challenged increasingly by several people both within and outside the so called yes. system of uh, you know his- history writing in india No, no, no. De- definitely, I, I completely agree, and uh, I would like to mention that uh, Pawan Verma ji also mentioned in his book, the, the Great Hindu Civilization. He said that we cannot, you know, uh, overemphasize the achievements of ancient India, and at the same time, we cannot say that no such civilization existed because it did. There is ample evidence, so you can't overemphasize something. You have to take it as it is. It was there; these things happened. and whatever tales of invasion and all the need to be told not because we want to demean some someone but because it happened it should be told and history itself is if we say itihas is what as it happened so the yeah. idea should be to tell things as it happened instead of you know saying being politically correct or uh, you know in talking in terms of particular narrative only which suits some political interest or some particular agendas definitely and i think uh what we are talking about the best example is the indian freedom struggle for example which 
you talked about the history of indian freedom struggle and your books also worker talked extensively about that there are many people who of course led to who sacrifices uh, led to india becoming a free country but unfortunately if we read our like school and college books it indicates that it's only the non violent struggle which actually led us to uh, uh, you know independence de di hame azadi bina khadak bina dhal and uh, when the narrative came that uh, जानने कितने झूले थे फांसी पर कितनों ने गोली खाई थी फिर क्यों झूठ बोलते कि चरखे से आजादी आई थी so, महात्मा गांधी डेड हैव अ रोल वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट रोल बट टू से दैट ओनली ही लेड टू इंडिया इंडिपेंडेंस इज समहाउ यू नो डाउन प्लेइंग और इवन डिमीनिंग द रोल ऑफ मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंटली द रेवोल्यूशनरीज एंड एज यू मैंशन एक्सटेंसिवली अबाउट द रेवोल्यूशनरीज इन इन योर बुक इन स्पेशली द फर्स्ट पार्ट आई थिंक दैट मस्ट बी एन आई ओपनर टू मेनी पीपल लाइक हु वॉज द Uh, Madan Lal Dhingra, who are the Chapekar brothers, and all many of them, we were not aware. We knew that okay, Sena Pati Papad, there is a road in his name. Uh, there is a Feroz Shah Mehta, there is a road in Delhi and Mumbai. But this, their role was actually not given the due importance. And it also, people were of the view usually that they did not work as a cohesive unit. So there was one Sada Shahid Bhagat Singh, there was someone Chandrasekhar Azad, and some Chapekar brothers and all. so the fact that they are downplayed in the narrative of indian freedom struggle what's what's your take on that so that's very true because uh, you know as you rightly said uh, this it, it, uh, and this was this was the outcome of what happened after yes. independence yes uh, so we have that famous episode where i think post independence uh, i think there was a government committee that was established to relook at the history of the freedom movement and uh, someone none less than the very erudite historian rc majumdar was supposed to head that committee to rewrite uh, or, or uh, you know document and chronicle the history of the freedom movement many of the people who were part of the struggle were still alive so he would have had a lot of first hand information too and documents and all of that and so he was to put this together but then rc majumdar was some uh, was one person who had a mind of his own and yeah. he told the government that i'm not going to be a court historian right so and i'm going to uh, also very critically and uh, assess the uh, impact of the congress the flip flops of gandhi and what it did to the freedom movement itself and so on so for which the committee itself was disbanded he was summarily deposed from the committee and in his place there was some antara chand or somebody who was not even a historian uh, he was a diplomat who was put in uh, in uh, you know charge of this project so that became very clear to all the existing historians of that time that if you need the government support if you need government largess uh, and that's uh, in uh, those days where that was the only way of earning a livelihood for scholars for people who are academic right um, you know university jobs fellowships all of this uh, then you needed to toe that particular line which yes. was you know that the de di hame azad bina khad ke bina dhal wala thi where uh, as i uh, repeatedly say uh, we should not disparage the role of anybody yes uh, yes the or the uh, nationalist movement uh, that the congress launched because i think for the first time it brought all indians together and gave that very strong sense of uh, nationhood and wanting to uh, be free itself but then that was not the first or the only movement yes. that was yes. right from 1857 which was coined by savarkar as the first war of indian For independence uh, where the the whole idea of breaking free from the shackles of british rule began to 1946 which we very ironically still call the naval mutiny and not call it as the last war of indian independence yeah so the unending uh, you know um, uh, stream of revolutionary movement armed struggle tribal revolts sanyasi rebellion the secret uh, groups which were there in different parts of india largely maharashtra bengal punjab and like you uh, alluded to uh, what we are told in our history books is these were just isolated events of exactly exactly individual bravery which was largely misguided you know they were brave people but they didn't have a sense of strategy right. just through random bombs here and there uh, shot somebody dead and then very bravely they went and uh, you know uh, hung from the noose but that was not the case as uh, you know in my research on savarkar too i saw that uh, you know even in the early 20th century you had the abhijit of yeah. the savarkar yeah. uh, acting completely you know in uh, uh, coalition with the uh, secret groups in uh, bengal whether it was the anushilan samiti yeah. 
Gantar, Swadhin Bharat, all these different groups. Uh, so people like Aurobindo Ghosh, uh, Barin Ghosh, um, Prafulla Chaki, uh, all these people, Kanayalal Dutt and so on. And, yeah, and... Maharashtra contemporaries. Yeah. Uh, and later the, 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 the uh, Punjab um, uh, people also joined yes. in. You had, you had the Gadar movement in yeah. the, uh, during the uh, First World War where yeah. it was not only uh, confined to India but also transcontinental. Uh, you know, where in uh, North America San Francisco and Canada and Germany, uh, so on, where uh, they were trying to ally with the German Kaiser to have an invasion on the British uh, India through right. the sea, the land, and try to liberate. And this was the same chain that continued through the 20s, through the, you know, the HS, HRA, HSRA, all these movements, whether it was of Sachindranath yes. Sanya, Ashwakula Khan, then of course Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev Rajguru, and then Rash Bihari Bose, who founded the INA, and eventually uh, uh, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Uh, heroics and the Indian National Army was what got India our freedom, as was mentioned uh, by none less than the Prime Minister of uh, Britain, uh, at least, yeah, about uh, uh, why they left India. So I think look at and we've 75 years now uh, since freedom i think we need to be a little more dispassionate be more clinical in assessing the impact of all these movements uh, as i said gandhi's movement was certainly very uh, important but we also need to critically analyze that every time the movement was speaking up uh, whether it was the non-cooperation, whether it was the civil disobedience, uh, the Quit India movement was, of course, uh, a, a complete failure in the Congress's yeah. words and it disassociated yeah. from it. But both these other movements, every time it peaked, uh, he would resign it, yeah. go back on it. And that actually put the, uh, you know, um, struggle back by several decades. And Thank several people in the Congress itself, whether it is Maulana Azad, whether it is Pandit Nehru, others, had a lot of uh, misgivings about this with Gandhi. Uh, yeah the things that we need to talk about today they were all politicians they were all none of them was a saint right. uh, so whether it's Gandhi, Nehru, Savarkar, <laughs> Ambedkar, whoever it is who are part of the larger you know uh, uh, leaders of the time today we need to be able to not uh, get so touchy and sensitive about it uh, exactly. about each of them and make a critical scholarly assessment of each of their roles what did they do what were their uh, you know failures yeah. and what might we have the luxury of retrospective vision today. We can look right. back what is what is good and what is bad. So I think that analysis we shied away from. Uh, you know, it's almost uh, uh, also an icon whom you cannot question. So which uh, a lot of uh, injustice to uh, the cause of history and the cause of the history of the freedom struggle. Of course. And I think it's like we, we are uh, looking at it from two extreme viewpoints. Either we completely demonize someone or we put someone on a pedestal who can't be questioned. Yeah. So I may have respect for Mahatma Gandhi, Pandit Nehru, but if I want to question them uh, that, okay, this particular move was wrong, I don't think I would be getting a huge audience saying, no, he was the father of the nation or that Pandit Nehru did many great things or even any other Congress leader. So you should not actually, you know, you question them. They are being put on that pedestal and uh, you just can't do that. And when it comes to uh, people like Savarkar, so they are... Uh, the way they are portrayed in our textbooks and even in the culture in general, the general view is more on the negative side rather than, you know, on the positive side. So I remember I'm talk I was talking to uh, one of my friends about your books on Savarkar and I said that, you know, it's not about being pro Savarkar or anti Savarkar. I think uh, what Vikram has done, he has made us understand who Savarkar was. You can still leave it to your interpretation, but very importantly, a great attempt has been made to for people to understand who was Savarkar actually and not someone, it was not a politician's uh, viewpoint, it's a historian's viewpoint that I think this kind of scholarship uh, uh, should be encouraged. So a similar question related to that, would you say as a historian that especially in these times, history is being looked at in terms of the binaries of left wing and right wing. So if Vikram Sampath or Sanjeev Sanyal or uh, Hindol Sen Gupta who wrote a very great book on Sadar Patel, if they write, they are, are the right-wing historians and if uh, Ram Guha or uh, Romila Thapadji writes something, it's a left-wing historians. So do you see this, this dichotomy or binaries which are being, you know, followed in, in terms of uh, reading of history are, is concerned? Yeah, it's not at all, not just history, Abhishek, I think every aspect of life yeah. 
from media from public discourse uh, people have lost the whole sense of nuance yeah uh, here box uh, someone into pigeon holes and yeah. put a uh, now um, i also keep getting uh, i keep hearing that uh, i'm supposedly a right wing person right. and so on I, i don't belong to any wing i belong to the truth wing of indian right. history my idea is to bring out the facts as they are yeah. uh, it's if it uh, some part of it coincides with something that the so called i don't even know what this right and left business doesn't even uh, hold true for a country like india it's a very western concept yes. uh, it's probably the left and the non left or the indic wing or whatever else it is called so but if some of it coincides with some of their viewpoints it's just coincidental it's not mm. something that is actively thought about and uh, very importantly uh, my um, you know approach and philosophy to writing history itself is that the historian should not be a judge of whatever uh, exactly. you know, we we can critically analyze but then passing judgments in the manner in which many historians do um, i think that's not really our work uh, our work is to as i always say illuminate the archives uh, bring the facts out into the public domain to people who might not be either interested or have the ability to go and uh, scurry through archives and bring out uh, all the material there so bring those out lay all uh, sides of the spectrum and let the people decide you don't have to spoon feed somebody uh, i think so even in my books on savarkar i have tried to portray uh, his positives as well as his negatives the second volume i'm pretty critical of a lot of decisions that he took now he was the one kept on uh, you know criticizing gandhi for his flip flops but the one opportunity that history gave him uh, to actually take the lead when gandhi and the entire congress brass was in jail right after the quit a moment those two years were very very crucial uh, where uh, he had announced a direct action kind of a, a thing you know a, right. a mass movement like a satyagraha uh, they they did one in hyderabad which was extremely successful uh, for the civil rights of the hindus uh, of hyderabad who were oppressed by the nizam there so on and that was hugely successful then you had one in bhagalpur in yes. bihar where the british tried to clamp down on the hindu mahasabha uh, you know annual convention so that also uh, you know several of them protested and uh, managed to get uh, you know the convention was held even from jail uh, by several of the hindu mahasabha members yeah. so after that there was a lot of uh, you know excitement within the party that we should uh, do a similar you know nationwide mass movement yes. and that himself had announced it an economic boycott at that time you know when the world war was going on and uh, british resources were really crunched if they had actually launched a massive you know economic boycott uh, yeah. or a political movement then probably the uh, direction of uh, the struggle and the importance of the uh, mahasabha and savarkar himself would have been something very different and several yeah. people like sham mukherji had actually uh, advocated that strongly there was a the divide in the party because of that and because savarkar did a flip flop now here was a man who was all the time uh, you know criticizing gandhi for doing that and when as i said history gave him that opportunity to lead from yeah. the front he made a flip flop for reasons which i have elaborated but i think so those are critical issues which we can look back today and say hey i think these were some of the faults that this person uh, committed yeah. so i think that sort of a laying the you know landscape of the pros the cons all parts of it and you, i think we must in, uh, you know uh, have faith in the uh, intelligence of the reader and that she will be able to understand yes. uh, the advanced view based on all the facts that are presented to her of course so so, so coming to savarkar as you know someone who has read very extensively about savarkar wrote a two uh, volume uh, biography of savarkar what in in your view if you have to describe savarkar briefly as as a person and as a freedom fighter how would you describe savarkar very 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 complex uh, at the same time very enigmatic and a very interesting figure who means many things to many people simultaneously uh, you know uh, but the facts of history which are cold and straight forward are that he was someone who organized india's first ever organized secret society uh, mela which later became the abhinav bharat <laughs> who organized the first ever bonfire of uh, foreign clothes uh, in india while he was a student at ferguson college in pune yeah. uh, led the movement uh, 
uh, for Indian independence, a firebrand revolutionary while he was in London in the five years that he was uh, at the India House there, and several other wonderful characters who were with him there: Shamji Krishnavarma, Madam Bika Ji Kama, Madan Lal Dhingra, uh, M P T Acharya, B B S Iyer, um, Sena Pati Bapat, Lala Hardayal, who later formed the Gadar Party, Sitender. Yes. and several others who were with him there uh, someone who wrote the first uh, you know magnum opus on the uh, 1857 revolution it uh, became veritably the bhagavad gita for all the revolutionaries who came uh, you know after him whether it was bhagat singh who published it or uh, subhash chandra bose and uh, rash bihari bose who got it translated and published uh, so and his so his contribution that way to the intellectual corpus of the revolutionary movement what it meant was very important someone who also suffered the worst of inhuman tragedies yeah. after being captured as a d category criminal sent away to kalapani for uh, 14 years that he uh, endured there 12 years in kalapani and two in the indian uh, you know mainland terrible terrible inhuman tortures there after which uh, you know he was conditionally released that he would not participate yeah. in politics for 5 years uh, and also stay confined to ratnagiri for 30 uh, for uh, the that uh, time of uh, period but the british really did not trust him and that's why those five years kept getting extended and two years two years extra extra and then it finally became 13 years so yes. here was a man who went to london to train as uh, you know a lawyer who's uh, 14 years in hardcore jail and 13 years in house arrest in ratnagiri yes. 20 a man's life was just snuffed out like that uh, but in ratnagiri uh, you know he launched the entire social reform movement yes. a complete eradication of the caste system, caste system. Uh, about which we know so little yes. uh, caste marriage inter caste dining the first inter inter caste cafe where yes. people of all castes sit together and eat the patit pavan mandir in ratnagiri in 1931 yes. where all people of all castes could go Let's and go worship and the propounder of hindutva uh, which he wrote in jail in 1923 uh, in the backdrop of the khilafat movement and putting that entire hindutva ideology into practice in ratnagiri by unifying the hindu society later on of course uh, after coming out in 1937 uh, you know the the uh, the joining of the hindu mahasabha as its president and making it a electorally fighting fit yes. uh, organ uh, against the muslim league against the congress right. uh, but had his failures at that time as i mentioned in the earlier answer uh, and also uh, you know went on to um, be uh, implicated in the uh, assassination of mahatma gandhi of which he was of course acquitted honorably so uh, but then that albatross stuck up on his uh, neck and he died quite disillusioned um, you know committed his own uh, death so to say by king uh, eating in uh, drinking and taking medicines in 1966 but alongside a very very sensitive poet a contradiction of sorts a fiery revolutionary who had also the sensitive heart of a poet uh, who could see the ocean and then burst out into a poem uh, yes. who could see everything around him nature and so on and, and actually put those down in poetry uh, etch po- poems and verses on the walls of the cellular jail um, you know with his nails and with charcoal and so on Uh, a prolific writer a journalist uh, you know an amateur historian of sorts yes. a playwright um, so uh, very very multifaceted that's why i said very complex uh, multifaceted uh, personality who meant many things to many people at the same yes. time at the same time a political ideologue whose hindutva uh, of course metamorphosed into numerous versions and it is in the political ascent uh, yes. today all over and that's where his relevance also comes into picture yeah. so i think that long answer to your very short question of telling yeah. savarkar in brief i think when you talk of savarkar you can never be brief <laughs> you can never be brief so as as you rightly said it means many things to many people but one very important aspect about savarkar which i think i would say most of the people would not be aware of before your book came out is his work towards caste eradication the caste system eradication and he did lot for the a uh, welfare of the dalits and you know making sure that now we talk about bhimram bedkar ji and we rightly credit credit him for you know doing so much for the dalits and the backward caste uh, we have babu jagjeevan ram and all who people know that they work for the welfare of dalits but uh, unfortunately i realized after reading your book that sveer savarkar also did a lot for the dalit upliftment 
and sadly he is not mentioned when we talk of the uh, struggle of the dalits and the lower caste he is completely forgotten as if he did not do uh, you know uh, anything he was not at all linked to any of this and bhimrao ambedkar ji and savarkar's view points actually converged on the welfare of dalits they both are concerned about that they both wanted the caste system to be kind of you know eradicated and they both were uh, against many you know points view points or uh, actions of mahatma gandhi which they uh, mentioned and as you mentioned in detail in in your book and in fact in one of the movies i remember i saw on uh, savarkar i'm forgetting the name it's on youtube wherein uh, savarkar had a conversation with mahatma gandhi and uh, he talks about that you know the caste system should be done away with the system has given us uh, nothing although mahatma gandhi had a different view point and then on the violence as well that like when savarkar said that itne bade desh ko azad karana hai और शत्रु इतना साधन संबंध है तो आप कैसे ये कह सकते हैं कि आप बिना सिर्फ नॉन वायलेंट मींस से ही जो है यू कैन गेट इंडिपेंडेंस सो आई थिंक वन वन फेलियर आई वुड से ऑफ आर यू नो हिस्ट्री बुक्स एंड ऑल इज दैट व्हेन वी शो सो मच कंसर्न अबाउट द कास्ट डिस्क्रिमिनेशन एंड वी डू नॉट ब्रिंग टू द पब्लिक दैट दिस वॉज वन मैन हु ऑल्सो वर्क अ लॉट फॉर द इराडिकेशन ऑफ कास्ट सिस्टम एंड बिकॉज एज यू सेड वेन ही वॉज अंडर हाउस अरेस्ट i think that is one of the core things he he worked on during all these years because he was not supposed to participate in in the freedom struggle but then as as we said it's history is the handmaiden of victors so one another important point how do you explain uh, savarkar's hindutva and do you think the way we see or understand hindutva today is different from how uh, savarkar envisaged it so uh i think you know when he coined uh, the word was already there yes. the chandranath bas yes. book about it in bengali literature but then yes. he published it with his book in 1923 which as i mentioned was in the backdrop of the khilafat movement yes. where on a very very communal issue i think people were being mobilized uh, with good intentions by gandhi to bring the hindus and muslims together but then the repercussions were terrible for the country because the khilafat movement failed and it led to all kinds of communal violence all over the country and so on uh, and in that backdrop is where he posited this entire idea that uh, hindu uh, not necessarily the term of the religion uh, hinduism and he says that right at the beginning that the, the term has nothing to do with the religious uh, theological aspects yeah. of the religion but yeah. it's a national uh, identity uh, where anybody who lives within this uh, landmass from the uh, mountain to the ocean and considers this uh, land as the land of their ancestors and also the land they owe their allegiance to unlike you know the khilafat which was actually positing uh, you know indian muslims to the turkey uh, you know caliphs and so on yes. so that doesn't do that that person is culturally and nationally a hindu and he could be following any faith in his personal domain yes. and during uh, i mean in the second volume of my book i talk extensively about his speeches uh, as the president of the hindu mahasabha where he says um, you know uh, the f- free hindustan that will be there Uh, that will have uh, i mean everybody is going to get equal opportunity uh, the majority will not get extra privileges because they are more in number and minorities will not get concessions because they are less in number mm-hmm. in the eye of everyone is the same you can keep your religious practices to your house and so i think that was the core of what actually secularism mm-hmm. should be mm-hmm. where you don't give public domain uh, or give uh, you know privileges appeasement concessions and all these kind of things so uh, uh, even in fact the constitution of free hindustan state that uh, the hindu mahasabha came out in 1945 it has no mention of religion anywhere uh, but then at the same time the, the religious aspect of that was that you know the hindu society was so fragmented yes. and so uh, and an, as an answer to political islam which was raging its head the pan islamist movements the wahabi movements and so on you needed a counter an intellectual counter to that uh, because yes. the one hand you have uh, theologies and philosophies which are egalitarian which accept the whole world as one family and all of that at the same time we must uh, acknowledge that that is a, there is a clash of civilizations there yes. where there is the world view which takes a very unilateral view that it is either my way of uh, worship which is the only true one and anybody who doesn't subscribe to that uh, is uh, is condemned and 
can be converted can be killed it's a religious sanction so in such a case what do what does the egalitarian society do does it just leave its arms down and sit down and allow to be predated or does it at least organize itself for self defense and so right. that was his uh, uh, you know, the, in the second volume, I also have this very fascinating conversation between him and Shaukat Ali, who was yes. a part of the movement, where he says, you know, we have nothing against any group, uh, whether it's the Muslims or the Christians or whoever else is there. It's just that we are doing this for our own, uh, you know, uh, for our defense. If we organize yes. ourselves, if we remove our own, uh, you know, evils which are there in our society, what is your problem? Uh, we are not going to, you know, uh, uh, hurl the first stone at anybody. We are going to just, uh, you know, uh, ring fence ourselves against all attempts to, um, uh, to, to be predatory on our faith. Right. So that was Hindutva that he spoke about. So Hindutva was, uh, for him, I think Hinduism that resists right. and also Hinduism that reforms, uh, you know, which of all its evils, because unless you reform, uh, then you cannot right. have a Sangathan. Uh, and the movements itself were called Hindu Sangathan movements. So the Sangathan, Sangathit Rene Kelly, you had to get out of all these, uh, you know, uh, evils, like caste and divisions and discrimination. So it was, in my view, a very forward looking and, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, altruistic kind of a movement, which sadly has been very, very misrepresented as being communal and, and all that, which is not true. I agree. Hinduism that resists and then that reforms, but I think conveniently that reforms part was uh, kind of removed and uh, all negative connotations were actually, you know, added to uh, Hindutva that this is the political thing and it's, uh, it only means completely, uh, you know, anti-minority uh, and this is what uh, Hindutva stands on. There's a pole plank of, of the BJP and this is all that is to the, the BJP or the RSS it, it itself. So, uh, talking about so, yeah, no, sorry, this whole thing, I mean, resistance is almost, uh, you know, shown to be something that is bad. Uh, bad. To be, we have to be so pacifist. We have to oh, no, but we are a very, uh, you know, ahimsa kind of a uh, country. But uh, how is that even justified? Uh, you know, like yeah. the all, at least in the the Hindu philosophy or the Sanatan yeah. Dharma that we have. You have all our uh, gods and goddesses with, uh, you know, weapons in their hands. Yes. And these are weapons for ornamental, uh, you know, purposes. They are, uh, if whatever is adharmic, uh, you are allowed to exercise your uh, strength of might and annihilate that. Uh, so that was the constant clash also between Savarkar and Gandhi, even dating back to their London times. Yes. When they're uh, in that desert speech where Gandhi says, uh, you know, I want to talk about Ram Rajya and establishment of that. Savarkar comes back and says, hey, uh, even Ram Rajya to actually establish it, uh, you, uh, Ram had to go and uh, fight Ravan. Uh, right? Absolutely. The bloody battle. Uh, he didn't go and sit in front of Ravan and do a Satyagraha and then leave exactly. Sita with Ravan go, uh, took pity and then left her and went away. So you had to fight. And the Dashera, uh, which was the nine days, you have the Devi, uh, uh, you know, killing uh, the different uh, demons in the Durga Saptashati and so on that you look at. So if you consider the British Raj as evil, then you are justified in uh, picking up arms. The Bhagavad Gita says, uh, where Krishna says, you can, uh, if your opponent can be your father, your uncle, your brother, whoever, if they are on the side of uh, Adharma, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with religion, it has to do righteousness and non-righteousness, that person needs to be, uh, you know, dealt with in that manner. So I think this very idea of making us a very pusillanimous civilization, a very, uh, you know, pacifist, this thing, this is a Gandhian romanticism, uh, which has been perpetuated post-independence. And so that's why, you know, my other book, uh, Brave Hearts of Bharat, which actually talks about these very acts of valor. Now, Valor is not something to be ashamed of. Uh, today, after centuries of so many waves of invasions and so many waves of conquest, if we are still around as a civilization, we are the only, probably the, one of the oldest, uh, you know, living civilizations. We have maintained our languages, we have maintained our faith, we have maintained our, you know, rituals, traditions, customs uh, in every nook and corner of this country. Uh, a lot of it, part of it is also our civilizational strength, but a lot of it is also the physical resistance and the power exercised that we have all told to feel 
very uh, you know ashamed of or don't even talk about it let's put that under the carpet all through we were a very very pacifist and a uh, you know non violent uh, people which uh, i think in my view doesn't do justice to the way we look at our past we look at our past alex avarkar mentioned to gandhi in that movie that krishna gant mein shishu pal ka vad karna pada tha because there is no other you know option uh, left similarly we seen in ramayana mahabharat they always resisted that that there be no war but when there is no other option left of course then you have to go and fight and in fact in india's example if we see what happened after independence when pakistan sent all the, the soldiers to the border we had to fight to to get kashmir and of course it was uh, somewhat not planned that well and we ended up losing kashmir uh, for that matter but the same country with the same people with mahatma gandhi being there was it was before he was assassinated uh, we had to send our uh, army to kashmir and if my understanding is correct even it has uh, mahatma gandhi stamp that of course we have to you know get our our land uh, we cannot just let it go to pakistan just like that uh, so it it happened in the same country which followed uh, uh, these ideals of course you can't have for follow these ideals in an, any event you have to look at it and plan your your move accordingly so uh, coming to savarkar again so this is what is actually hindutva i think very well described by you in your, your book as well uh, another thing about the kala pani so i mean i have read that book but uh, about the book in which you mentioned but how do you would like to explain the punishments being given to uh, that kologa bell punishment and many people you know committing uh, suicide and people being hanged or uh, you know they have been forced to stand with they were chained and forced to stand for like number of hours every day so all those atrocities if you'd like to give a brief overview of those yeah that's a gory thing to do on a sunday morning but uh, uh, they have endured that we are just talking about these things so i think the basic you know uh, human rights which uh, people uh, uh, you know are eligible to as uh, uh, you know political prisoners even that was denied to them yes. uh, food uh, um, or toilet facilities uh, and so on so uh, there were fixed timings in the day when you could actually use the uh, restrooms um, and so the food that was served to them was mostly you know it had pieces of reptiles and uh, you know uh, lizards and this and that and so people who would eat that would end up with diarrhea and so for that if you had to go to the toilet you were not allowed to uh, and so most of them would defecate urinate in their own uh, you know cells and those cells were also uh, tiny tiny cells if you actually go to the uh, uh, you uh, cellular jail you will see that that those are extremely small cells in which they were holed up and in that uh, you know to urinate to defecate and then to sit and sleep and eat amidst your own squalor i think that was the kind of uh, you know totally uh, soul sapping experience for many of them and in the heat of port blair most of them had to do this koloka bell punishment that we spoke about where that oil grinding machine uh, where instead of the bullock that is usually uh, yoked to it uh, the freedom fighter was put there and through the day they had to extract about 30 pounds of oil um, and at the end of the day if they have not uh, brought that out they would be whiplashed and not given food and so on uh, so and also medical facilities most of them would fall sick the gunny sacks that they would wear because of that there would be skin rash rashes and so on skin infection leeches that were there that would you know suck their blood and so because of this there were so many problems but none of them were even taken to the uh, you know hospitals uh, for this many of them went uh, you know uh, they lost their mind they became insane uh, there was an entire asylum that was started in haddo island uh, in uh, the, uh, for this many people uh, began to uh, you know uh, commit suicide uh, you had indu bhushan roy you had ulaskar dat who tried to do this and so people like this who uh, they were electrocuted all kinds of you know uh, today britain talking about human rights and all of that the indian bastille that this uh, uh, you know cellular jail was i think uh, uh, we 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 are, we have we are well within our rights to demand a very strong apology from them for what they at the least uh, you know kind of tortures and this was done there were uh, almost hundreds of uh, you know political prisoners m- uh, majority of whom came from bengal uh, a few from maharashtra then punjab after the gadar movement then of course tamil nadu and united provinces and other uh, states so it was almost a pan indian uh, conglomerate there uh, and only the revolutionary movement uh, people were yeah. sent by none of the 
uh, you know congress workers were ever sent there so the government was very clear who was their biggest threat and so the most dangerous criminals as they saw saw these people they were all packed off there to break their soul to break their spirit uh, and to ensure that uh, you know they give up on their fight of course and you though you rightly mentioned not a great thing to discuss on a sunday morning but that was the reason i wanted because all those who are attending this session should actually you know know and what actually what sacrifices people made to you know uh, make india free we have to look beyond the charkha and all which what is uh, independence so i think yeah and as you rightly said savarkar means uh, many things to many people and so now uh, and let's hope that you know we have more scholars like you who write with uh, dispassionately about savarkar and other freedom fighters of course Uh, we already see like sanjeev sir coming up with his book on revolutionary so let's just hope that more and more such literature uh, is is there for people to decide you know whom to worship or whom to not so coming to your uh, latest book brave hearts of bharat uh, my my question about is that a how did you decide about those 15 personalities and how did you do that research because uh, i am sure i have read a fair bit of history but many people i even did not know the name of and then i read Okay, these are the people, the makers of India in a way. So, how did this research and these these names happen? Yeah. So, uh, in fact, yeah, it was an outcome of the conversation I had with Sanjeev, uh, my good friend, uh, where we were talking about you know Indian history being this long litany of wars that we have lost as a nation, and that's yeah. how we remember. Uh, you know, uh, even in our history textbooks, all the wars that we have read of are of wars that we have lost. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, if we are still surviving there must be some wars we won also yes. so what those wars who are those uh, you know warriors and who are the heroes and more importantly also the heroines the women uh, who in this uh, you know centuries uh, long struggle so that was uh, one motivating factor and also the highly you know delhi centricity of uh, the manner in which we look at our history where everything uh, uh, around delhi and its uh you know uh, dynasties are studied in detail whereas large swathes of india get completely underrepresented uh dynasties and people and uh, you know heroes uh, from other parts of india so that was uh, that those were the uh, you know uh, main factors and these 15 people i wanted to have a, a pan india you know spread right from kashmir lalita ditya to naiki devi in gujarat to all the four south indian states uh, abbakka martanda varma velu nachiyar raja raja chola and rajendra chola then rudrama devi then the northeast about which we read so little uh, you know about the ahoms or their uh, you know bravery they ruled for 600 years uh, so lachit bar khukan from assam the rajshri bhagyachandra jay singh from manipur uh, banda singh bahadur from uh, you know punjab kanhu ji angre the naval admiral of the maratha navy uh, from maharashtra Uh, Chand B B Begum Hazrat Mahal. So it was also I you know they we you spoke about binaries. It's very easy to slip into this Hindu versus Muslim kind of a binary. Yeah. Get the long march of history. A lot of that was not so. Yeah. The, that you know from the 15th century, 16th century, the 18th century with all the confusion that exists uh, in the 18th century before the British actually took over. You had uh, you know rival uh, kingdoms fighting each other with no sense of Uh, you know religious identity uh, at all so uh, that is also so the the nizam was fighting uh, uh, tipu sultan um, whereas ideally they should have joined hands if uh, religion was all matter yeah. the marathas the nizam and the british made a com- uh, confederate alliance against mysore so these complexities of history need to be i think understood without uh, you know extrapolating everything to contemporary politics uh, yeah. of binary of a versus b so that's why people like chand bb begum hazrat mahal they also become important because hazrat mahal if you look at the contrast in 1857 she led a very very valiant struggle uh, in lucknow and lucknow was the last to be capitulated yes. british but at the same time you had the uh, ahmadullah shah who was there uh, in um, uh, lucknow who was fa- looking at the struggle as a jihad uh, as a religious war uh, of the muslims against the infidels whereas um, hazrat mahal had in her army both uh, you know hindus and muslims mm-hmm. and lot of dalits uh, um, and lot of women uh, people like uda devi pasi and others of the pasi community who were part of her uh, you know women corps 
so uh, so that holistic view of uh, you know some of the warriors and kind of let's differentiate and say these are our icons and these are our heroes yeah. whom we should respect and not those who have very totalitarian to- totally you know um, um, unilateral views about um, uh, nationhood and about history so that was the choice that i had to make uh, it was more of a choice of whom to leave than whom to take because it was just so uh, but I- as i mentioned even my prologue this is not the ultimate uh, you know list i'm right. sure many i hope uh, you know many more uh, scholars and historians start picking up these tales from uh, nooks and crannies of india which have not been covered uh, because there are so many of them oh unsung uh, and uncelebrated so i think um, if you're talking of 75 years and amrit mahotsav and all of that i think there is a need to then start celebrating these people uh, and so hope it spurs a lot more discussion a lot more work in different uh, you know uh, mediums and platforms oh absolutely absolutely in fact not just these 15 people even i have noticed in popular discourses and debates even some of the well known people are in some knowledge is very limited so for example uh, sadar patel he is rightly credited with being the iron man of india he, he united india but he did lot many things even before independence which people are unaware of the bardoli satyagraha and many things and as hinol wrote in his book he was a financer uh, of the congress and no revolution can be fought without uh, money so he he kept those wheels uh, moving similarly with subhash chandra bose uh, many people know that okay he founded the indian national army but what exactly did the indian national army did and this was a mutiny the, and this was actually not people don't actually understand the significance of uh, all that happened so th- coming to this book again would you like to tell a bit about uh, lachit borfukan because the one who defeated the mighty mughals uh, i think the only time i heard his name was in one of the amar chitrakatha books <laughs> and this is it. and after that i uh, uh, read in your book and yes one by anish kokle his book brahmaputra and uh, this is it and he is someone who you know defeated the mughals so if you'd like to give us a brief sketch of uh, lachit bofukan and the battle of sarai ghat yeah so not only lachit uh, abhishek it's i think the entire assam itself i mean the name itself called assama you know uh, being invincible yeah. in right? uh, there were so many attempts that were made uh, by uh, you know the uh, the turks by the afghans and then the mughals and others to invade assam so people we, uh, we don't even know these names people like king prithu and others who in the past had actually uh, you know even defeated bakhtiyar khilji who yeah, yeah. otherwise in his campaign in bengal uh, burnt the nalanda and all of that and then went to assam but uh, there he was literally uh, he had to run away for his life uh, so similarly uh, you know every few decades when there were attacks assam kind of uh, you know held back uh barring a few small you know decades where it would come under for an occupation uh they managed to throw anybody who invaded them uh, out so of course under um, you know shah jahan and so on you had uh, mughal invasions where part of western assam was taken over uh, and that was something that was really uh, the, the the nadir of the ahom dynasty but yeah. the, uh, the chapter on lachit uh, to me is also like a case study uh you know on strategy on how the subaltern uh, and the underdog should actually you know assemble play to your strengths uh, to defeat an opponent who is militarily and numer- numerically much stronger than you uh, and actually draw them to your uh, you know uh, strength and area of warfare and then eventually defeat them so it has a very very descriptive uh, you know uh, story of how they organized themselves it became almost like a national uh um, project for them they uh, they uh, you know kingdoms project everyone right from the peasant to the uh, nobles to the soldiers uh, reclaiming your honor that became uh, the most important uh, you know preoccupation for everybody and with that kind of passion which was led by the ahom ruler chakradwaj singha and jayadwaj singha and these people yeah. and lachit who was their barpokan or their military general led that whole uh, campaign and uh, uh, aurangzeb uh, wanted to crush this force and so yeah. sent the largest imperial army to uh, you know uh, assam uh, kamrup uh, the raja jay singh of uh, uh, raja ram singh of jaipur and so that was defeated uh, you know through the naval uh, route which was 
what the uh, ahoms were very good at uh, yes. on the putra and there was lots and lots of uh, you know elephants that were there uh, which were used in and a lot of bamboo in the forest which were used to make all these uh, boats um, there and through the naval strength they ensured that this mighty mughal army uh, was repelled in the battle of sarai ghat this is in 1671 and uh, uh, ram singh had to go back and the mughals never looked back to conquer uh, you know assam so that story of valor that story of invincibility of this region and probably that's one reason why it has not featured in a national discourse yeah. uh, so i think now this, this the last year was also the 400th birth yes. anniversary yes a big way so by the governments of both india and assam um, it, it does some justice to the memory of this great hero so oh, absolutely and talk about this this uh, naval strength i think kano ji angre as you mentioned uh, also built this uh, you know naval structure and uh, you know saved his coast and everything and he had that vision at that time wherein you know we did not have much to say in terms of engineering prowess to speak of but they did what they and shivaji did which i think also mentioned about uh, that this was his success if we uh, see you know in in our history uh, kanu ji was there and coming to ahilya bhai holkar i, I guess uh, this is one example wherein because today it's you know fashionable to blame uh, the hindu or indian society of being you know uh, uh, more of a uh, patriarchal society dominated by men and all but we had examples of elia bai holkar who not only was a great ruler but also built a small army and all uh, and one of very good we have an indore airport named after uh, her in the remembrance so uh, can you explain a bit about elia bai holkar and her contribution to you know modern india wow that okay, will take an entire session in itself because yeah, i think she we have to of course keep it brief i know yeah so yes i mean again so seven out of the 15 heroes in this book are women so yeah, ahilya really. one important person who uh, you know when we talk of patriarchy you also had her fa- uh, father in law yes uh, who actually ensured that the daughter in law got uh, education got um, was trained in uh, all aspects of Uh, state craft uh, finance administration and so on and when he died uh, when her husband died he ensured that the daughter did not commit sati uh, and when he died she became the successor and that was a golden era for uh, indore uh, the kind of welfare state so again another case study on leadership on what, a, what the ruler needs to do how benign uh, you know a kingship needs to be uh, and how almost a maternal love for uh, the subjects not only human beings but she used to also have uh, you know for the hot summer months like how we are facing now uh, water and food kept for uh, birds and stray uh, animals and so on so that kind of maternal affection that a ruler needs to have for all her subjects whether it is uh, human beings or uh, you know other living beings so i think these are very important uh, you know lessons and the civilizational uh, resurrection uh, that she did through the reconstruction of all the char dhams the 12 jyotirlingas uh, almost linked the north south east west you know uh, what with bringing uh, water from the ganga from uh, kashi to rameshwaram and all these uh, type of things where she culturally i think uh, you know uh, reconnected the whole country that is why uh, though she was not a warrior in that sense she and raja jay singh too uh, who revived uh, the whole vaishnavism and uh, uh, krishna bhakti that is there the ras leela tradition in manipur that's why these two people feature in this book as civilizational warriors who resurrected the civilization in times when it was under uh, decline so i think that's where their importance comes in. i think Yeah. Yeah. to the audience i think yeah so we are opening for the audience please start writing your questions i guess some of you wrote earlier i will see if i can retrieve any of them uh, uh okay and all those who are attending please you can start writing your questions i have access to all okay so there is one uh, words on by shitesh pratap words on rana sanga please well that will be <laughs> that will be a completely different story uh, i think we should keep it for another day uh, because no, i think no, that no. i i completely agree okay so let me see the other questions there were some questions were coming so let me check in the history if there are so there were a lot of questions earlier yeah i think 
right from the you know, getting quite distracted with so many questions coming there yeah so so there is one interesting one ki akbar mahan tha ha huh? so this is the yeah. question kya akbar mahan tha so this is the question uh, okay i this this you can take this one first sirs your take on uh, ncrt overhaul truth about atrocities uh, by moguls has also been raised so what's your take on that i think it's a more uh, relevant question for our times no i, I like i mentioned right at the start i think i'm com- completely opposed to this whole idea that something needs to be excised how can you wish away anything of your past whether you like it or not these things happen yes. uh it's done with the sense of rationalizing the history book uh, because i don't know there's so much of misinformation the ncrt chairman himself has come out and said we've not removed anything we've just you know reduced the burden of, right. on students so i think and nobody has seen the textbooks still i think the textbook new textbook itself has not come so it's a little premature to jump the gun and the media does this for all its uh, right. you know kind of uh, uh, sensationalism we need to wait and see what it is if it is a rationalization to ensure that as i mentioned all parts of india get coverage and at the expense of reduction of uh, a little bit of this maybe assam maybe south india maybe yeah. uh, rajput maratha history also come into uh, this or vijayanagar empire as someone has mentioned there also gets a uh, larger importance uh, than the just the moguls who currently i think have three or four chapters on them uh, in the textbook yeah. that is still okay. but to completely take them off is a wrong thing you have to have a balance there to uh, good, good aspects that they brought but also teach the students about the atrocities about the injustices that were committed uh, you know uh, during that time kya akbar mahan tha there were two aspects to his life that so that's where the balance comes in the first part of uh, of his life he was quite a uh, quite a bigoted ruler uh, we have so many accounts of that his uh, siege of chittorgarh to where uh, you know uh, the kind of atrocities that were committed there uh, and there are uh, accounts where he talks to tells his uh, court poet badawni uh, when when he badawni says he would like to uh drench the, his beard with the blood of kafirs he uh, you know shabers him with gold coins and all of that this father monserrat who talks about uh, you know how uh, several temples were destroyed by him and the blood of uh, you know cows was sprayed on it and so on so that is an aspect to of the early part of akbar's life but later on uh there was a change of heart there was certainly this dinelahi movement uh which he tried for which actually he was chastised by the ulema the orthodoxy yeah. that he was being un islamic and so that is why successive rulers whether it was jahangir uh, or shah jahan and so on uh they kind of toned down this whole uh, you know uh, assimilative part of the religion and so by the time it came to aurangzeb it had reached the uh, heights of bigotry uh, and the fatwa yeah. he very clearly mentioned what uh, you know what needs to be done to those who do not follow the the faith uh, and even in the heights of the mughal rule uh, jazia and the revenue from it uh, came to about almost 20% of the government's revenue so all these aspects of uh, uncomfortable aspects of our past also needs to be included uh, nothing needs to be excised i am not at all in favor of such uh, you know uh, censorship when it comes to history okay. because you can't wish it away Sure. So there, okay, there's this interesting question by uh, Divya Shree Hegde. Uh, Vikram, do you come across lies of common people during your research? Of course, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's very much a part of uh, you know all the 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 research that happens. It's just that you know the kings and queens and all of that about them. There is a lot of written material, but then a lot of accounts. Like for instance, now uh, I'm someone asked right in the beginning, what was your next book? So I'm working on. the history of mysore under the time of hyder ali and tipu sultan and right. so uh, so in that you know a, a lot of oral history a lot of uh, accounts of uh, you know common people uh, are recorded either in in uh, you know uh, regional languages indian languages or also even someone like a francis buchanan uh, as a, in his travel log when he travels through malabar mysore and the madras country he documents the lives of peasants of weavers of um, you know uh, people potters and uh, their stories and so on so all this also forms i think a very important part of uh, history and not just the ruler of course the documented history uh, the the victor writes it the handmaiden of the ruler so yes. he 
or she would have the uh, uh, you know authority to get it written but where it is you have the oral traditions oral history folklore uh, all of that which convey uh, the story of the common uh, people as well absolutely okay i think we are on top of time so uh, it's already 5 past 12 but i'm sorry i can't take all the questions but uh, yeah there are many to- sorry we can probably take another one yeah, because no. it was quite a- this is uh, yeah this one i was thinking okay this is yeah so why nobody talks about chalukya dynasty chalukya dynasty and it's true that uh, himmadi pulkashi was the first to stop the arabic invaders in southern part of india yeah that is true uh, so along with i, I mention him in my book on brave bharat so bharat uh, but not a complete chapter but in the chapter on dalita ditya so on, in various fronts uh you know whether it was in the north you had lalit people like lalita aditya in kashmir and uh, yasho varman in kannauj uh, which is uh, uttar pradesh today they were forming an alliance and pushing back the arabs then the western and southern india you know pulakeshi uh, then you had bappa raval you had uh, nagabatta uh, and also the rashtrakuta uh, you know um, this one danti durga danti durga who all formed an alliance to push the arabs uh, out so we had several such uh, you know instances and that's why beyond that narrow strip of sind the arabs could not con- conquer much of uh, you know uh, yeah. india uh, and you know we must keep in mind that while within a few decades after the death of the prophet uh, while the caliph and the sword of islam managed to subjugate vast parts of central asia uh, northern africa and so on in india it took almost 500 years to establish an islamic uh, you know so it took so so long to actually subjugate the people which meant that a lot of people kept giving resistance uh, for five centuries and it was only later we of course capitulated uh, but uh, uh, we must also take into account these 500 years who were the people who actually uh, kept that bulwark against all these uh, you know uh, attacks so pulakeshi was one such person who unfortunately as you mentioned is not uh, talked about much as also all the others lalita ditya or bappa right. raval and all these people do not uh, get mentioned no certainly and cool that again there are many questions but of course uh, we can't take too many questions and one more thing we got a lot of uh, appreciation messages also coming in and i think they far exceed uh, the questions in in numbers so once again thank you very much for uh, joining and vikram thanks first of all for writing these books more power to your pen and maybe maybe see more and more books from your end and thank you for your time today thank you abhishek and thank you your reviews as books wale bhaiya is i think widely read and widely appreciated so thank you also for you know reading uh, all my books and uh, you know critically reviewing all of those uh, which uh, you know i think reaches out to a, l- a larger section of readers and thank you for hosting this session today thank you so much vikram have a good day good day to you and to all the listeners